Ah, the Silver Age. Perhaps the greatest decade for heavyweights in boxing history. Perhaps. Well, one thing is almost certain. This is the last great era for heavyweights. Coming out of the Lost Generation's decade of the 1980s, the heavyweight division had seen a renewed spark at the arrival of Kid Dynamite. The man who had unified the division as its first undisputed champion since Leon Spinks in his upset over Muhammad Ali in 1978. Despite the roar Tyson evoked throughout the division and boxing world, he wasn't the only dominant champion of the 80s. Tyson's dominance of the latter half of the 80s had further overshadowed the reign of the great Larry Holmes. The two clashed in the 80s, and Tyson stopped Holmes convincingly. The late 80s also saw a few more precursors of the 90s. Evander Holyfield, after unifying the cruiserweight division, took the leap to heavyweight. George Foreman returned from his retirement 10 years after the Jimmy Young upset. Super heavyweight finalists Lennox Lewis and Riddick Bowe turned pro. Heavyweight gold medalist Ray Mercer entered the pros. My point is, the 90s were shaping up to be an interesting time for the division, with old and new faces gearing up to take their chance at reaching for the brass ring. To do so, however, they would have to dethrone arguably the most dominant champion ever in iron, Mike Tyson. In 1989, the documentary Champions Forever released, featuring the five great champions from the Golden Age 1970s. It featured the timelines of their reigns and added interviews from the great men in relation to their exploits and how they all elevated one another through rivalry. The documentary is a must-see, and I had to include it here as I missed it in the 80s timeline. Also in it, does Big George Foreman continue to declare that he will regain the heavyweight title? Larry Holmes alluded he wasn't quite done either. Best of luck, old man Foreman, and I hope we see you come back too, old man Holmes. Teach these young fellows how to box. So-called old-timers George Foreman and Jerry Cooney opened the decade in The Preacher and The Puncher. Clearly, no one took this bout seriously regarding either man, considering it was cast aside as the geezers at Caesars. Foreman's comeback had been mostly against journeymen and relative nobodies, leading to everyone overlooking his desire to be world champion as nothing more than wishful thinking. Cooney had been sporadic since his loss to Larry Holmes in 1982. When they met on this night, both men impressed the boxing world. Cooney became one of the ball. only men to stagger George, George in his comeback, and Foreman added some much needed credibility to his second career when he blew Cooney away in the second round. It was one of the coldest knockouts in heavyweight history. Tony retired after the bout. In your mind, are you too big for the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, Mike Tyson? I would probably knock him out a little quicker. Same thing that happened to Jerry Coney tonight would definitely happen to Mike Tyson. Tyson is back as the bout was billed. The dominant, undefeated, undisputed champion had but one job to secure 
a mega payday against impending rival Evander Holyfield. Beat James Buster Douglas the same way he'd beaten all of his other opponents in the 80s. A mere formality on the road. Douglas was a 42 to 1 betting underdog and it was clear that Tyson and his team weren't concerned with him. Beyond this, the promoters already had concrete plans for the bout between Tyson and Holyfield to take place on June 18th. Unfortunately for Tyson, a perfect storm had brewed in the lead up to the Tokyo Dome clash. Douglas was more motivated than ever to win after the passing of his mother. He was in the best shape of his career both mentally and physically, the opposite of the reigning champion who had been on a silent downward spiral since departing from his original fight team that stemmed from his father figure Custy Amato. Tyson's team, assuming the champ would run through Douglas, didn't even bring the necessary components to take care of their injured fighter. Tyson was floored in sparring by Greg Page two weeks before the bout, and ominous reports said Tyson would potentially be his own downfall. But none of the reports believed it would come against Buster Douglas specifically. Again, Buster was the most motivated he'd ever been, as was noted by those in his camp. It's quite impressive how he took the passing of his mother and turned those 23 days before the fight into the ultimate motivation rather than it zapping him of his drive and will. Adding to this, Douglas watched the mother of his son suffer a severe kidney ailment and himself caught the flu a day before the fight. Bobby Brown claims he and Mike partied like crazy the night before the fight. According to Bobby, Mike said Buster Douglas was nothing more than an amateur he didn't need to prep for. In summary, everyone, including Tyson, was expecting another 90 second blowout a la Spinks. Well, everyone except Douglas, his camp, and the Columbus Dispatch, which published an article placing their faith in their hometown fighter, forecasting the biggest upset in history. Alrighty, let's get to the fight. Douglas outboxed Tyson for the majority of the fight, wearing him down until the moment came when Tyson decked Douglas with a vicious uppercut that sent him to the canvas. It looked like Tyson had saved his championship after all, until Buster rose from the dead. Long count or not, Douglas survived the round, and the moment truly came in the next round when he blasted Iron Mike to the canvas with a devastating combination. Mike struggled to find his mouthpiece on his way to his feet and failed to beat the count as the world watched the unbelievable. The once invincible champion had been nerfed to size by an apparent nobody. In the biggest upset in boxing history and perhaps even sports history, James Buster Douglas had just become the new undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. The heavyweight division had been flipped on its head and the dream match between Tyson and Holyfield had seemingly been thrown to the smoke. In the aftermath, Don King wanted the result voided on claims Douglas received a long count. Initially, the WBC and WBA agreed and refused to recognize Buster, but severe backlash led them to join the IBF in recognizing the new champ. Among this backlash were threats of chief powers withdrawing from the WBC. Douglas sued to break his contract with Don King on the grounds. King voided it when he tried to overturn his win. King would receive the promotion rights to a rematch, but Douglas would first have to defend against Evander Holyfield, an event which King would have no involvement. 
The upset as a whole not only ruined Tyson Holyfield, but also a Tyson Page matchup, which would have been interesting given Page dropped Mike in sparring. It also ruined a potential Tyson Foreman dream matchup, something I'm still irate didn't happen. None of these matchups would happen, nor would Tyson and Douglas ever meet for a rematch. Despite the many rumors swirling around all three would-be matchups. Tyson Douglas, like Tate Weaver a decade before it, changed the direction of the entire division and is worth a what-if on if Mike had won to come down the line here on Boxingpedia. Why did you win this fight that nobody on the planet gave you? Mother. Mother. In what mother. Was it? God bless your heart. The WBA's number two and three ranked contenders, respectively, Donovan Razor Ruddock and former WBA world champion Michael Dynamite Dokes were fighting mad. The two men exchanged blows for an even contest up until the fourth round in which arguably the most vicious knockout came when Ruddick caught Dokes with a hybrid hooker cut. As Dokes lies stunned on the ropes, Ruddick finished him with a sharp right and left, followed by a wound up left. Dokes had been finished by the smash and lie unconscious on the mat as celebrations ensued for the victorious Ruddick. Big George returned three months after vanquishing Jerry Cooney and did the same to Mike Jameson. The bout saw Foreman fluctuate his tempo in accordance with Jameson's resistance, culminating in two knockdowns. A wild uppercut in the third sent Jameson's mouthpiece to oblivion and froze him in purgatory. Foreman dropped Jameson twice, once in the third and again in the fourth for the stoppage. Before we move on, in the pre-fight, Foreman stated how Mike Tyson losing the title didn't change anything. He was still going after the belt, no matter who had it. In fact, he was only calling out Tyson because he had the belt, not because Tyson was his goal. 21 straight wins in his comeback now. Evander Holyfield stopped Seamus McDonough in four rounds, dropping him twice in the first round. A necessary tune-up for Evander to keep the wheels rolling, so to say, before challenging for the title. Sadly, it wasn't to be against Iron Mike, and questions would remain for years. A doubleheader that may have been hinting at a potential clash between the headliners. On June 16th at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, George Foreman stopped Jose Adelson Rodriguez in the second round to add further credibility to his comeback, as Rodriguez was the first top 10 ranked opponent Foreman had faced. In the main event, Mike Tyson embarked on his road back and stopped former two-time amateur conqueror Henry Tillman in the first round. It was sweet revenge for Tyson and fuel for onlookers who felt the loss in Tokyo was a fluke win for Douglas. The most, Tyson was still the best heavyweight in the world and had had an off night against Douglas. A rematch with Douglas would surely answer all questions. If Douglas could defend the title against the number one contender, Evander Holyfield. Big George returned to the squared circle against journeyman Ken Lacusta. The hometown hero of the night, Lacusta, was a sparring partner of Mike Tyson's in his preparation for Buster Douglas. 261 pound foreman easily outmatched the 216 pound smaller man with the incoming in the third. 
A leaping left hook from George dropped LaCousta, but to his credit, he would answer the count and lash out with an almost destiny-altering overhand right that rattled Foreman and woke the crowd up. Foreman, sensing the tide, turned up the heat and showed how vastly superior he was when he finished LaCousta off shortly after. That shot from LaCousta must have had Foreman's life flash before his eyes. Imagine the comeback ending right there. Yeah, right. Foreman moved to 68 and two on his career. 70 fights, wow. Not many make it that far. Also, Foreman entered this bout ranked fourth by the WBC, seventh by the WBA, 10th by the IBF, fifth by the WBO, fourth by the NABF, and seventh by the USBA. It's safe to say the old man had proven he was not a joke and was coming for them belts. A slugfest through and through. They tagged one another in the first and both fighters tasted the canvas in the second. Johnny Deploy was knocked down twice, however, and did rise from the second but the referee called it off as Johnny looked to be in a different dimension. Good, quick buffet of brain damage for all you savages like myself. In one of the great underrated slugfests in boxing history, merciless Ray Mercer and schmokin' Burt Cooper took one another to hell. The bout was Cooper's first defense of the NABF title and would see him taste the canvas in the first round after a solid right from Mercer. Somewhere in the madness, Cooper broke Mercer's jaw. After 12 rounds of nonstop brutal action, Mercer was awarded a unanimous decision and the title. To this day, Mercer sees this bout as one of his toughest and has love for the fallen warrior, Burt Cooper. Four months after the Doak's horror story, Razor Ruddick returned and scored a similarly terrifying knockout of Kemuel Odom. When the bell rung to end the second, the two had a stare down and Ruddick threw a left that knocked Odom down. He was penalized. In the third, Odom came on strong with the crowd cheering him on, but Ruddick struck back. He landed a right uppercut, a right hook, and finally, the smash. Odom collapsed backwards into the corner and would fail to beat the count. It was even in the same spot in the ring as the Doke's baptism. Odom timbered backwards and appeared lifeless on his way down. Razor Ruddock appeared to be the most dangerous heavyweight in the world. He expressed his frustration with being ducked in the post fight. He wanted the undisputed title and didn't care who had it, be it Tyson, Foreman, Douglas, or Holyfield. He just wanted his shot. A challenge to all the heavyweights in the, in the um, division. Tyson Foreman, um, Evander the Holyfield, Buster Douglas. I'm ranked number three in the heavyweight division, and um, I think they should acknowledge the fact that I'm there. Do not overlook me. I'm here to stay. In his first real test since turning pro the previous year, the Eddie Futch trained Olympic silver medalist Riddick, Big Daddy Bo dominated faded ex-champion Pinklin Thomas until the bout was finally stopped after eight harsh rounds. Many onlookers felt the fight should have been stopped much sooner than it was. Ringside doctors, the referee, and Pinklin's own corner were questioned on commentary as to why they allowed Bo's barrage to continue for as long as it did. How different would this fight have been if it had taken place in Pinklin's heyday? Riddick Bowe had gained some legitimacy with this win over one of the 1980s best heavyweights. 
In an easy mode first round knockout, Big George Foreman shoved aside Terry Anderson and came ever closer to a world title opportunity. And he did it wearing trunks that may have been the same trunks he wore on his way to the top in the early 70s. He was hoping to face off against the winner of the Douglas Holyfield matchup soon. At 42 years old, sooner rather than later would be best for the ex-champion. Foreman said after how he felt that his power had finally fully returned to him for the first time since the Rumble in the Jungle. 69 victories, 65 knockouts, only two losses, one to the greatest of all time, and another to an underrated 70s contender who should have arguably beaten the greatest. The next time we check in on Big George, it'll be his chance to banish the cloud of Zaire and regain his honor. Was it to be? We'll see. Foreman is someone to be reckoned with. You know, I have my eye on you, George. The possibility that James Buster Douglas is going after George Foreman. Judgment Day was on. On the undercard of the event, rising star Riddick, Big Daddy Bo, took on fringe contender Burt Cooper. Cooper had put on a good showing against Ray Mercer, compounded by the fact that he was a natural cruiserweight who'd made the jump to heavyweight. Cooper punched Bo to the body during the stare down, to which Bo returned the favor. Riddick would go on to knock Cooper out at the conclusion of the second round, increasing his stock in the heavyweight sweepstakes. In the main event, undisputed champion James Buster Douglas would defend his title against the universally recognized number one contender, Evander, the real deal, holy field. Douglas had clearly fallen off since his upset of Tyson and came in both overweight and unmotivated. Holyfield, on the other hand, came in on top of his game. Holyfield easily controlled the first two rounds, outlanding and outpacing the ill-prepared Douglas. In the third round, Douglas made one of the worst mistakes a fighter can make, something he did consistently in fact. He led with a wide uppercut. Holyfield capitalized with an assassin accurate counter straight right that sent Douglas to the canvas. The manner by which Tyson's conqueror gave up was frustrating. After landing hard on his left side, he checked his face for blood and simply rolled over on his back. Obviously, Buster failed to beat the count. And the new undisputed heavyweight champion of the world was the real deal. Holyfield would receive flack for not beating Tyson to become champion, but surely a bout would be put together between the two soon enough to square such criticism away, right? Douglas, meanwhile, would briefly retire into an unhealthy lifestyle that saw him balloon to 400 pounds and enter a diabetic coma. He recovered and made a mild comeback in the mid 90s. This is always the worst time to ask about a future, but do you think about that now? What was to be the grand finale of a 
perfect series of movies didn't go as planned. Rocky V returned to the series' roots after Rocky IV had pushed the bar to almost comic book level heights. Real life boxer Tommy Morrison starred as Tommy the Machine Gun, a pupil Rocky takes on in his forced retirement after the war with Ivan Drago. The film sees Pauly get tricked by the family accountant into signing over power attorney, after which the Balboa finances are blown through a failed real estate flip by said accountant. This leads to the cast returning to the old neighborhood, Rocky neglecting his son in favor of guiding Tommy, and the corrupt George Washington Duke destroying the bond built between Rocky and Tommy. Rocky has heartwarming flashbacks to Mickey throughout the film. Duke attempts to goad Rocky out of retirement on multiple occasions to no success. On the side, Rocky's son, Robert, now in public school, learns to fight to deal with the school bullies. Ultimately, Rocky and Tommy score off in the streets to settle Tommy's grudge. The boxing world refuses to acknowledge Tommy as the true champion because Union Kane was nothing more than a paper champion. Rocky outduels Tommy, squares away Duke with a body shot in the aftermath, and retreats to his family, vowing to never jeopardize his relationship with Adrian or Robert again. Rocky and Robert climb the steps one last time, and a timeless montage of the five films closes the franchise for the next 16 years. It's by far the worst of the franchise, but it isn't a horrible movie. In fact, the work print of the film almost puts it on par with the others, in my opinion at least. To round out a stock hiking 1990, Razor Ruddick finished the outmatched Mike Rouse in the opening round. Bob Sheridan remarked how everyone knew Ruddick would knock the big guy out. It was just a question of when. Well, it happened with the second knockdown and Razor Ruddick was looking as sharp as ever. Get this man in the title picture already. Mike Tyson embracing the hard way back in his last bout under HBO would take on Alex, the Destroyer, Stewart, in an easy demolition job that saw the former champion drop Stewart three times. Tyson left HBO because of Larry Merchant's comments after the bout on Tyson choosing to fight Stewart. If HBO brought back Merchant, Tyson was gone. That would be the case, and Tyson made his way over to Showtime. Tyson's easy destruction of Stewart, an ex-Holyfield opponent, only provided further fuel to the narrative that mighty Mike was still the true champion. To round off 1990, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Evander Holyfield was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, but he wasn't the people's champion. That honor still belonged to mighty Mike Tyson. The two were on a collision course to decide the true champion in the coming 1991. Without a doubt, the ring's upset of the year was Buster Douglas destroying the myth of Mike Tyson. Tokyo Douglas was the pinnacle form of an otherwise unrealized fighter. Ring Magazine didn't select a heavyweight round of the year, but for the sake of our retrospective, it's got to be the first round of Mercer Cooper. Mercer sent Cooper to the canvas. Cooper returned to his feet, and a pattern began in the round that would last the entire fight, an endless back and forth slugfest. Ring Magazine, again, didn't grant the heavyweight spite of the year, but for this retrospective, it's the grand upset 
of Buster Douglas over Mike Tyson. The heavyweights did not receive the Fighter of the Year honor, but for us, it's got to be Big George Foreman. The born again Foreman showed the world he was legit in 1990 and was on course to put the division on notice in 1991. As noted in 1989, Ring Magazine discontinued its championship. I neglected to switch the titling to discontinued for 1989, so we'll start here. Still, remember that 1989 should also say discontinued as opposed to vacant. The Ring title wouldn't return until June of 2002, which we'll cover when we get to a timeline of the 2000s heavyweight boxing division. Donovan Razor Ruddick was on the hunt for a marquee opponent exiting 1990 and had his sights set on a title fight with Evander Holyfield. This fell through when Holyfield instead opted to face George Foreman. Inaugural WBO champion Francesco Damiani Fought twice on the year, winning both, but neither bout was for the title. He would put the title on the line, however, to open the next year. Riddick Bowe won his other six fights on the year and moved to 21-0. Bowe went 13-0 the previous year, 1989, his debut year. Lennox Lewis won all eight of his fights on the year, moving to 14-0. All of his victories on the year but one came by stoppage. The lone warrior, Ozzy Ocasio, became the first man to survive Lennox. Only other time Lennox didn't stop an opponent was in a DQ win the previous year. Lewis went 6-0 his debut year, 1989. On February 23rd, Buster Douglas refereed the WWF's main event three matchup between Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man, Randy Savage. It was supposed to be Mike Tyson, but Tokyo happened. Inadvertently, this caused a butterfly effect of sorts. The WWF's golden age ended, the Ultimate Warrior failed to replace Hulkamania, and WCW would grow to overtake WWF in the ratings. Tyson would, however, appear in the WWF eight years later, which would turn out to be better anyway, because it aided the wrestling promotion in the Monday Night Wars against WCW. In fact, Tyson's cameo of sorts marked a turning point for the WWF, as they maintained the momentum he gave them. His 1998 impact showed that he may have saved the WWF back in 1990 beforehand. This all, of course, is a story for another timeline on another channel. Be looking out. On April 4th, an 80s bread rematch saw Bone Crusher Smith score a win over Mike Hercules Weaver via unanimous decision. Back in 1986, Bone Crusher stopped Weaver in one round. Overall, 1990 showed that there were many contenders for the title. The demolition of Tyson's invincibility aura only opened the playing field further, but there was still a chance to restore it in full if Tyson could reclaim his title from Evander Holyfield. The world anxiously awaited the truth.